Uh, I'd like to welcome from Los Angeles today. Um, you arrived last night, right, Dr. Oh, Ching? Um, oh no, but you, you you arrived on the plane. You were saying earlier, yes. right, from from Hong Kong, but arriving from Los Angeles Sorry. yesterday. Um, Dr. Cheng was educated with a, a PhD in electrical engineering from McGill University and has spent over 20 years in industrial experience in energy systems and low carbon technology development and deployment. Um, he's worked on climate adaptation, renewable generation, smart grid, end use technologies, and has frequently published in peer reviewed journals. Um, he's been a senior member of the CLP Research Institute since 2004 and is currently serving as senior manager on the sustainability group. He's a registered professional engineer in Ontario and is a member of the IEEE, among others, and also a secretary of the WEC Hong Kong member committee. Um, he also worked in many different um, Canadian companies, including the railways, national defense, and so I'm really looking forward to your, your presentation on uh, smart grids in Europe. Uh, actually, what I'm going to share with you today uh, is something that I've learned in the last um, five or six years. Um, I'm an electrical engineer by training. Uh, my background is on large-scale uh, power systems and system control and so on. So if I give you any jargons that you don't quite understand, just raise your hand. I, I'll try to explain um, in a layman's way. Uh, but smart grid is actually uh, quite attached to my heart because as an electrical engineer, uh, I think Professor Abe uh, will agree that you know whenever people talk about electrons, we, we jump up and down. Right? So when you talk about smart grid, it's like the future of you know electrical engineering. So I'm automatically very interested. So I've been on this uh, for a number of years, and some of the slides actually has been presented uh, in the past. So if you happen to see them, excuse me, uh, but uh, it was done like uh, some of them were were at uh, I, uh, international energy agencies. Uh, and, and we were sharing some of the concept there. I borrowed a lot of them from uh, the Japanese uh, colleagues as well. Um, there you go. This is our traditional grid. So traditional grid is very simple, three words. A generation, transmission, and distribution. And this is a very simple illustration. So it, it, it goes uh, from here generating. So the original generation is mainly fossil fuel, hydro, and later on nuclear. So these are all very uh, manageable, and, and the resources are you know, basically right up there. Uh, and then we go up the higher trans, high voltage transmission because we want to save the losses, and also for long distance, because a lot of times all these resources are very far away from our low center, and then you, uh, you distribute them. Uh, I borrowed this from a, a, a Korean colleague. So, uh, you can actually find this uh, reference. The reason I like this one is because if, if you just don't, don't focus on anything in a whole, but just put your eyes on any one of these descriptions. I think the Korean actually put a very nice description of what all the smart grids ideas were talking about. So if you capture five of these, you actually capture something like, uh, well, 40, 30 percent of what smart grid is all about. So I, I, that's why I like this picture. I will talk about it more. But first of all, we have to talk about uh, if you believe in something, are you willing to put your money in that, right? So this basically is a uh, sort of like a calculate on, on the money that we have spent according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Bloomberg is a very well established uh, agency and they keep track of these things quite nicely. So the bottom line is every day since uh, 2004, who are spending every day about 9.4 million US dollar on these technologies. And these technologies are all associated with smart grids, from energy efficiency to energy storage, transports, and so on. So um, this is what I'm going to cover today. It's a long list. Uh, so you'll be, uh, everybody will fall asleep by then, so I ensure you will have a good sleep. Uh, but I think uh, if, if you want to um, look at smart grid in a holistic way, this is something you, you really have to look, look into. And, and that I have to thank uh, uh, Professor Mar, because it was her uh, who asked me, OK, John, you want to do a chapter on, on the book that we are, we are doing? So I said, OK. 
and, and then that's the end of it. So don't blame me, blame her. Uh, I, I think, uh, first of all, we talk about what are the drivers for, uh, for smart grid. I think um, I, I have four of these, but actually I end up five or six, but let's go through them one by one. I think the first thing is there's a, a constant change of social norm. So our kids now are more conscious about turning off the light and shutting off the tap than our generation and also our previous generations, right? So the notions of using more renewables and sustainable concept is changing the whole society. And that drives all these things happening. And then it's government drives. And I think someone mentioned the COP21 uh, to be held in uh, Paris uh, later on next month. Actually, the, the end of this month it will start. And COP21 actually, uh, well, my boss is not here, but, uh, but uh, my boss is one of the person in Hong Kong who has attended so many COPs. Uh, so the COPs from uh, maybe from 15 and so on, uh, she's been there. And, um, and all the COPs meetings are basically, you have to remember that these are the international gathering trying to get all the uh, country leaders to agree on a, a common uh, climate policy. And this policy actually, uh, some kind of uh, agreement, actually drive the electric industries a long way. And you have to be aware of it. Um, and then the technology push. Uh, Japan and United States, uh, also Korea, are all pushing all kinds of technologies. Uh, I ask you this question now, and you can answer me at the end of my presentation which will be like uh, 8 o'clock tonight. Um, the, how many of you, can I see a raise of hand, that you have personally bought a house or apartment yourself to this point? OK, not a lot. About 40% here. How many of you have bought a cell phone? It doesn't have to be a smartphone, just a smell cell phone in your life. Right? You make the decision to buy that. So basically everybody. Just keep that in mind. And of course, there's utilities only. Quite often, we kind of forgot. But actually, this is one of the driving force in the United States of smart grid, because their the grid is aging. So they have to replace. And if they are going to replace it, are they going to replace with the standard transformer, or they replace with something even better? So this is what the utility is always asking. But the killer is this one. Um, I don't know how many of you remember all these uh, events happening. September 11th, to all Americans, basically every American I talk to, they will have some kind of direct or indirect relationship with September 11th. You can see how much it has impacted the uh, United States as well as to the power industries. Because after September 11th, they start thinking about putting Patriot, uh, Patriot missiles to safeguard their nuclear facilities. Yeah, not to safeguard your home or mine, but the nuclear facilities. Um, and that's how all the distributed generation all started. Well, getting more attention. Uh, August 14, for all the power system engineers, you'll remember this date, right? Anyone? That was a major blackout sweeping the uh, northeastern part of the United States. Funny enough, though, uh, this blackout did not cause such a big impact to the United States all the rest of the world, like what happened in 1965. A lot of you ha haven't been born in 1965, but that was a major, major changes in the whole world of electric industries, because that was when EPRI was formed, FERC was formed, and so on. And all the regulations and all the research uh, about re uh, research uh, on, on this uh, started. I have a little, little uh, story to tell. I study uh, my uh, graduate study in McGill, and my professor was from MIT. And his professor was uh, also from MIT by the name of Professor Schwappi. And Professor Schwappi used to be a radar man in MIT. And because of 1965, he came out from the uh, radar uh, research organizations and started looking at the whole industries and trying to find out what can I do with this industry. And today, a lot of the US deregulations, uh, people heard about spot pricing? Yes? He started all that. And the book he wrote 
basically is the, uh, the Bible of today's uh, uh, electric industries. But the whole point of these is these kind of disasters that happen hit you in a very big way, but it's low of probability of happening. Um, this one's January and February 2008 in China. I don't know how many Chinese remember this. That was a major ice storm that affects the southern part of China. It wasn't very widely reported, but it caused all kinds of damages to state grid and southern China grid. And of course, the financial crisis. Uh, you heard of uh, Professor Ma talk about the Japan and, and, and China uh, smart grid development. I will give you somewhat of a different flavor of what I see the latest development in the Asian Pacific countries. China is no longer talking about strong and smart grid. They add one more piece to that. To that. It's called flexibility. They want to build a strong, a smart, and flexible grid. And this is exactly what the Europeans are also talking about right now. Because in Europe, they have up to 60%, and at times in Spain, up to 80 to 90% renewables. And if there's a storm coming through, they not only have to shed all the renewables, but also they have to do all kinds of things on their interconnections to make things work. So they have to make sure the grid being flexible enough such that with all these renewables and all the, uh, you know, the customer engagements, will be able to handle these kind of changes. Uh, Japan, actually, Professor Abe was mentioning, I, I just talked to some of the Crepi uh, 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 people. Crepi uh, is, is actually a Japanese uh, research organization. Um, I think right now, Japan is facing a, a major issue on deregulations. And all the individual utilities, regulators, cities, and so on, are most concerned of how they actually redivide the, the territory, how to go into competitions. So I think, and some of the Japanese colleagues may not agree, the smart grid development will probably have some kind of hindrance within Japan because of all, all these deregulations, the distractions. Um, Korea, uh, actually, I think the Korea government gave something like 800 million US dollar for the smart grid, national smart grid uh, development. I heard the news that that budget has been slashed by half. I think you, uh, Mr. Park mentioned that you know some of the company are not quite agreeing. What does that mean? Uh, let me cover Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, I think any Singaporean here. I was uh, with Sync Power uh, just last week, and we share a lot of uh, discussions. Singapore and Hong Kong share a commonality. That is, Singapore and Hong Kong are both a very developed city in a developing neighbor. So in many ways, we have to you know, push ahead. But in that sense, we also carry a bit of a burden uh, all around. So it's, it's very unique. Uh, and then India, Southeast Asia, and Australia, um, they all have their own problem. Australia mandated to have smart meters to be deployed in Victoria. I don't think that is going very well. Uh, all kinds of reasons. So that's your research project. I, I won't go into uh, detail. But uh, Southeast Asia, one of the problems of Southeast Asia is generally they are relatively um, poor. So if you ask them to put uh, an expensive smart meter there and going into all these kind of uh, uh, renewable resources investment, or customer engagement, it actually it puts an additional financial burden to them. So for them, they just want electricity. So now you're asking for more. Uh, that's also have a, a bit of difficulty. So it, does it paint a, a bad picture for smart grid? No. I think, first of all, we have to understand what smart grid is. So I put up these uh, pictures to illustrate some of the uh, intrinsic uh, nature of smart grid. So in the past, all the power flows are going this way, top down and one direction. But with a smart grid, we have solar voltaic, we have so, uh, wind farm, we have uh, BIPV and so on. And now we are seeing the power flow not just going between the distributions 
uh, nodes, but also may sometimes go up there. And people will think, wow, I can make money from, uh, from solar installations. But in fact, that creates a lot of problems for the uh, power, power utility. Engaging customers, uh, I think that's what we've been talking the whole morning. So how do we incentivize uh, customers? Uh, and if we have these uh, technology which is smart enough, uh, well, how can we uh, use them uh, alongside with some of these policies? So this is, again, new things. In the past, all we have to deal with is these uh, just basic consumptions. They just sit there and, and, and consume whatever they, they need, right? And then the generation side will actually you know, either turn up or down their generation to, to uh, make them balanced. But now, all of a sudden, on the customer side, they not only can generate electricity, but they can also moderate the, the uh, usage of electricity. And uh, distributed resources. Now, not all these are commercially viable, but they are commercially available. And, uh, you know, as uh, Professor Tanaka was talking about, uh, you know, uh, Japan, Germany, United States, all have these kind of things. And I, I go to visit some of these startups from time to time, and they keep telling me, oh, this technology is wonderful, and, and they are coming up, and they will be ready. Uh, but a couple years later, some of them have already shut down, so unfortunately. And smart grid is supposed to make our grid more resilient. Uh, I think if, if you talk about smart grid today, and I'll give you two, uh, uh, two tricks. Uh, the first one is you talk about flexibility. And second one is talk about resiliencies. So then nobody can fault you about uh, smart grid uh, deployment because resiliencies is what the smart grid in terms of distributed generation, in terms of uh, distributed energy resources, you will be our power if you are in the old configuration. And with the smart grid, you are having a better chance. So these are all the benefits of the, uh, of the smart grid. I, I did forget to mention one more driver uh, on the smart grid. Which, uh, aside from all the things I put up on the board, uh, those are what I conceive as the original driver. But from that, actually, for solar and wind, the availability of these commercial products has become so competitive. Everybody's seen that solar has come down in cost uh, significantly in the past decade. And that all started from 2008. There was also the Obama money start off the smart meter deployment and it costs a lot of the original things become more affordable today, including solar panel, rooftop, and so on. So that cost factor actually come into play in smart grid. Because now, in the past, the, uh, some of the solar facility was so expensive, but now people can afford it. And government support them, they can even afford it. I met a colleague from uh, Siemens. He's a Belgian. And uh, he was telling me, it pays him more to have his, uh, so his rooftop put on solar panels than he put money in the bank because the government backed him to do that, his bank backed him to do that, and uh, his wife also backed him to do that. <laughs> so uh, there's no reason he, he doesn't want to do that. So that is uh, one of the, the aspects of we talk about all these, um, all these uh, uh, smart grid developments. Uh, but these are the, some of the benefits. I won't uh, go through them all by all, all of them because I have some more to cover. But aside from the benefits, we have to look at the economics and the market advantage or benefit of smart grid. Um, from this morning, we talk a lot about on the distribution and customer engagement side. But I want to start off the economic factors from three levels. One is transmission level. Uh, at lunchtime, I talked to some of the Chinese uh, the colleagues, and there was one part of the smart grid we didn't cover this morning, which was a strong grid. Uh, on that side, um, for example, in Japan, in, in Western United States, uh, we have deployed all these uh, so-called PMUs, phase monitoring units. We have deployed all these special protection systems, SPS. Uh, we have also developed a lot of these uh, softwares 
that detect uh, this instability of the system on long distance transfer. And all these I consider as part of the smart grid because they ensure that bulk power transmissions get protected. There was one more thing. Um, in the past two decades, China has built up a massive amount of uh, HVDC, high voltage direct current transmission facility from the western part to the eastern part. This becomes actually a big challenge for a big grid because between the AC and DC, you have to well coordinate it before you run into all kinds of problems. It's as if, if you have your house consuming electricity, and I'll give you the pipeline to feed your house. The trick is how, how, it's not how to give you the electricity, but the trick is how well you're prepared if you lose all that power. And that is one of the tricks between AC and, 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 uh, and DC arrangement, because the transmission means it's very different. Uh, I won't go into detail on that. But there's a lot of, uh, of these development technically that has undergoing in the utility and we are not usually aware of. Um, okay, we'll jump to that. On the distribution side, I think I have more questions here than anything else is traditionally, if you are in the electricity sector, you are familiar with these terms. What these terms are basically a statistical measure of how well we provide electricity to a customer in terms of uh, number of outages, number of off, offline time or outage time in a year. So I, I remember somebody was telling me that uh, in, 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 in the United States, that is every year you expect, let's say, something like an hour that you'll be out of electricity. In Hong Kong, you're expecting minutes, right? But I think that's a, that's a difficult thing. Uh, I, I, I also almost talk about this every time I'm on the stage. Uh, how many of you have experienced a complete blackout in the last 10 years? These are all Europeans and Amer Americans or Indians or whatever. <laughs> Not in Hong Kong, right? The last entire blackout of Hong Kong as a city go back in 1980s. Right? I wasn't there. But I was in a blackout situation in Canada for last for over a week. Imagine in the sub-zero temperature, you have no power, no heat, and the street is dead quiet. Okay? And you, I, I practically feel like a refugee because I have to hop from one friend's place to another. The irony of high reliability is people are least prepared for these kind of disturbances. That comes back to the resiliency of smart grid. Smart grid has to be resilient in a sense that when we have these kind of major disruptions, whether it's natural cause or man-made, how are we going to withstand it? So with all the distributed generations and so on and so forth, these are the measures. Usually the regulator will, will allow the, uh, the utility to build or to compensate them in some way. But all these equations change if the generation is from your own rooftop, agree? Okay? Or some of the energy was stored in your battery and then you, know, you pump it out at, at, at due course. So when you pump it in, you're using fossil fuel. But when you pump it out, it may be, there are plenty of uh, renewables. So how do you calculate that formula? So this is some of the issues that researchers and regulators really have to address. But this is what is changing in the smart grid. Uh, you know, the nature of smart grid is changing. And who is going to pick up the cost of, of building? Professor Abe was talking about right, at the panel, who's going to pay for the cost? In the in United States, some of the utility are now trying to persuade the regulator that whoever has the capability to, to build solar rooftop, they have to pay a network charge too. Otherwise, it's not fair. Why is it not fair? Because it's only the wealthy who are, can afford to put up a rooftop solar on their houses. So if they say, I'm going to leave the grid, then how many of the people on the grid still have to pay for the price of the grid, no matter that price being the, uh, 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 the uh, mortgage of the entire grid and also the new build? So imagine you have 100 people and you have uh, 30 people who are wealthier and they put up solar rooftop. 
and the other 70, they, they may even have, some of them may have a problem trying to pay the, the monthly rate. So that's not fair. And some of the regulators in the United States are uh, aware of that right now. But this is, again, it's a social issue. Uh, it's, it's not easy to tackle. Uh, metering level. Uh, I like to call the meters on the, uh, on the, uh, on the electricity uh, utilities, it's a cash register, right? Every time the meter turns, well, it doesn't turn anymore because the, the electronic meter doesn't have a wheel. But every time it turns, it's, it's registered more money uh, for the utilities. But the interesting thing is, well, this, this may be a, a very, uh, uh, very uh, obnoxious uh, thought. It's uh, how many of you are using iPhones or smartphones? Practically everybody, right? So what happened one day? Uh, uh, Apple comes out and said, look, if you buy iPhone 7 or iPhone 8 or iPhone 10, I will pay for all your charging costs. Yes? They can do that. They know exactly where you are. They know exactly how, how you're going to charge and how much you will charge. They know exactly where you're located, where your utility is. They can negotiate with your local utility supplier and pay them whenever you charge. That's a mobile meter. So why would we need the smart meter? Interesting thought. But in, a, in many ways, it poke us and think about what smart grid will mean in the future. Samsung, LG, Whirlpool, they are putting their washer and dryers with a chip that can talk to IP address. So they know exactly when you will use electricity, when you wash your clothes, and so on and so forth. This is all part of smart grid. How would that affect you and I? That is the economics. And that is the market, whether the local regulations or the people are willing to take up that usage, and so on. Regulations, so that, all that was on economics, whether we derive any benefit from it. Traditionally, vertically integrated, a company take care of generation, transmission, and distributions. Uh, like most of the um, uh, Japanese, uh, some of the United States uh, companies, and Hong Kong, for example, is, 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 is the fact. And some of these, uh, well, by the way, these are off-grid companies. Eh? Uh, I'm not talking about Genco's, uh, generation companies, Genco's. Uh, one is, uh, this is a traditional one. The ISO, so the regulated environment or the generations part is belonging to somebody. And then it's only one uh, monopoly uh, system operator. And also some of these operators are actually owned by the government. Okay, so I have one entity. But this is the government, I say what it is, and you shall do it. And this is like the China government. Uh, they, they run, the government run the whole grid. And, and the regulator, under these kind of different structures, have all these things in mind. Okay? Whether they put emphasis on, on, on these things or not, it's up to the local regulations. So I, I, I'm an engineer, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm the least person you want to talk to me about policies. But in fact, the policy is driving all these things. So whether the government wants to do a climate change, a climate policy and whatnot, whether the government wants to in incentivize its, its citizens to take up more renewable, renewables or to do more energy efficiencies, to do whatever. Uh, Scandinavian countries are very easy to do that. And, and, and they are also at the forefront of this. I gotta watch my time. Um, objectives and regulation, I'll skip through this. And this is very important. I think what is the social benefit and the social side of smart grid? Uh, quite often, people don't mention it, but it is true. Uh, if I may say so, um, Korea is putting a lot of effort in this because they see that one day LG, Hyundai, or Samsung will take up this smart grid market. And everybody, just like your home, you have a nest. You know what a nest is, right? It's, it's, a, it's an intelligent uh, uh, thermostat. 
they want to in incentivize these things so that they can master the technology and there is a uh, marketing opportunity and that will create local jobs right and this is a national or maybe a community decisions and a strategy and this is very important emission and pollution control or reductions again this is a national or regional or maybe community type of decisions to see you know where do I want my society to go to uh, it's, it's uh, one of the question raised was are we willing to pay for the extra money but but then we also have to ask whether the society is willing as a whole or as a majority willing to go in that directions uh, customer engagement reactions uh, well I also use the term prosumers but unfortunately not a lot of people appreciate or have the luxury of, uh, of actually get to know what a prosumer is. Because in Hong Kong, for example, uh, I think only people living north of Lion Rocks will have a better chance of calling themselves a potential pro pro prosumer because of the uh, Hong Kong is all developed in a vertical sense. And you have to be able to have a lot of horizontal land to go for a prosumer. prosumer right? um, as an electrical engineer, I always like to talk about reliability. Uh, to me, reliability is very clear. Reliability is about security and adequacy. I won't go into detail on that, but the thing is, if you, I ask you to pay for reliability, most people will not. And I come back to my blackout uh, situations. Right now, if you ask any Hong Kongers to pay for their reliability costs, they will say, yes, I would like to have it. But if you want to increase the rate of it, they say, well, I would not have it. Okay, my time is up. So I, I want to uh, make sure that reliability is something that is an irony. Only when you lost it or somehow lose it, then you will realize how important it is and you're willing to pay for it. This is my roadmap to a holistic approach to, um, to uh, smart grid. And I think uh, I'll share this slide so you can get the uh, printout. I won't go into detail, but I think this is a, a good thing to look at in a holistical sense, not just to do demonstrations, to, to do R&D, but also to engage, and most importantly, is to educate your public. Uh, I won't go into detail. Um, I'm in the sustainability group, but I think uh, this is a good thing that I, I, I think it's easy to understand. It's called trees. So if you can deal with anything, smart grid included, you have to look at the technology, you have to look at the regula regulation or regulatory affairs, you have to look at environment, you have to look at the economics, and also the social impact. If you look at all, th all five of them, trees, you will be able to talk about sustainability in a more solid way. So that's the conclusion. Uh, smart grid is a necessity towards a low carbon environment. Uh, quite often we talk about renewables, but between renewables and your home, we need the grid. So what smart grid does is, is to link that up. So that's a necessity tool. Globally, smart grid has taken on different flavors. Uh, I, well, my previous presentation already tell you exactly what it is, so I won't go into detail. But there's no silver bullet or one size fits all. I think everyone have to really decide on how they want to progress towards the end of uh, the journey. Okay, I better stop there. Um, I, uh, I can entertain a couple of questions. Unfortunately, I cannot participate in the, uh, uh, in the, in the discussions later on because I have a plane to catch. Um, but if you have any questions you'd like to raise it, uh, send it to uh, Professor Ma. And I'll make sure I'll, I'll, I'll address to that. I think we have time for one or two questions. Thank you. That, that was wonderful. I, I guess the, the thing that I keep hearing about, the, the biggest challenge is that the industry moving from the traditional pipes and wires and generation vertically integrated into the 21st century means that the the cost recovery is just broken. And you mentioned that. Uh, if, if your reimbursement for the transmission is dependent on a charge per kilowatt hour and more distributed energy is being produced, then that's shifting the burden. And, and I'm, not, I'm not sure I, I agree that it's all from 
rich people are, are benefiting, because you could put solar panels on a, a housing estate as well. But it does mean that if we really are moving in this direction, we do need to find a different cost recovery model for this to work. And, I, and you mentioned that people don't like to pay for reliability. But I wonder if that's the key to the cost recovery change, is that we're, we're charging, utilities are charging for the distribution and transmission, but really all of those pipes are simply reliability tools. And if you just change the cost recovery model to say, you could put as much distribution or distributed energy, but you pay for your reliability. Forget about the transmission charges, forget about the distribution charges, just pay for reliability. Take as much electricity as you need, but you pay the reliability charge for us to become a reliability company. Yeah, one is the, uh, the uh, how do you uh, take care of the stranded costs and, and how, how that formula works. And the second thing is, is how do you compensate reliability? Um, the first one is uh, stranded cost is always be a problem. Since the day in the 90s, we, we started deregulations and so on and so forth. Some of the policy experts here will know a lot better than I do. And people have different way of uh, doing it. My own conclusion is it really depends on which regulators is willing to take whatever compromises they're willing to take. And they are willing to and able to sell it to the general public. Right? And uh, quite often the case, uh, this is a one directional flow. So uh, thou shalt do this and that will be it. Right? And, and this is what I observe. So it really depends on the local government, the politician decide, look, this is where we want to go, and this is it. The second thing is on, on reliability. Um, human nature is very interesting. Uh, if, if you have never suffered, you will never pay for it. Uh, unless you get some kind of bonus out of it or some kind of added value that you perceive as a value. I think one of the present presentation was about uh, perceived value, right? Um, the irony of it is we cannot induce an artificial blackout to get you pay for it, right? When there is a slight change of problems, we get blamed. I mean, I, I, I'm being a utility, right? And, and then you were told that you have not done everything that you possibly can. But in fact, we have built all the redundancies there, and things happen. I, I, I think reliability is something that we, as a utility, we handle it with great care. We have practices to make sure that things follow in our, from our experience, and our knowledge, that it will work. But uh, you can never guarantee 100%. So there's a 0.001% that will fail. And usually, that failure will cost a lot of money. But how, how are you going to do that? Because if you spend millions or billions of dollars to reinforce that 0.001% vulnerability, people will jump on your head and, and bash you to death and say, oh, you're wasting our money. So it's, it's, I have no answer for that. But I think it, it, the general public has to be aware that there is a reliability cost to it and how this is being do, due diligently done at the professional levels. And, and that, they have to accept it. Sorry, OK. Any other questions? So thank you, thank you again. Because I, uh, I apologize, I, I, I couldn't be here to, to engage on this. Thank you. John again. And now we have time for tea break. 15 minutes. OK, we have? OK, Victor said, yes. OK, 15 minutes. Yeah, please come back at. Um, 3.30, yeah, thank you very much.